Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Paul Burstein, professor of sociology and a member of the Jewish Studies program, and I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight uh, to hear the third lecture by Professor Yael Zerubavel, um, who is the director of the Ellen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life and professor of Jewish Studies and History at Rutgers University. The title of the whole series of lectures is uh, Encounters with the Past, Remembering the Bygone in Israeli Culture. And in, a, in the title, as it's written, bygone is in quotation marks. Um, but it's really the case that Israeli, as in Israeli culture, should be in quotation marks as well, I, I think, because um, early on, the Zionist settlers were trying to remember or use the bygone to create Israeli culture, which didn't exist. So Israeli, at least at the beginning of what they were trying to do, should be in quotation marks too. It was something that was very much in process. So from the very beginning, life in Israel manifested itself in ways that could never be encompassed in a single unified vision. And as Israel became more and more a normal country, Israeli life and Israelis' visions of themselves become more complex, more difficult, but also richer. And then what happens? We discover that the settlers, trying to make use of history to create a new nation, and the new nation itself, they become part of history. And now they can look back, those who are still around, the rest of us can look back on what they created, and they are part of the history themselves. And that leads us to the title of tonight's third and final lecture, when the old, when the new, when the new become old. Thank you very much. So the part of the challenge that uh, is uh, at the heart of the, to of the topic that we are addressing, the perception, the society's perception of itself is the fact that um, so much of the imagery and the self-perception of the society early on um, emphasizes the youthfulness, the novelty, the new beginning, um, that as people age and the, that new beginning kind of recedes into the past, there is a difficulty to come to terms with it. There is to say there is a slow recognition because the youthful images are so well, are so deeply entrenched. So the first uh, image that you saw was an image of the Chalutz, the Eastern European, and this is a typical image of the Sabra uh, that, uh, is be that became a kind of an iconic uh, image of the Sabra. It's actually a picture of Yaakov Shabtai uh, turned out. And here is another youthful image of the female Sabra on the half pound Israeli that, of course, is not in existence uh, anymore. Um, but what is happening is that it, since the 1950s, uh, the, the pioneers, the, the founders of Israeli society, um, are becoming old and uh, dying, and that's when we see in the 50s and the 60s, also after the foundation of the state, the early seeds of looking back and changing the, the view and being really interested in the uh, uh, pre-state past. And since the 80s, there is really um, a growing interest in that past because it's even the generation of the sons of the pioneers, the, the generation that we call the Palmach generation, that by this time becomes much older. These are people who are born in the 20s, and they are like the prototypical, the mythological sabras that are very, so much a, a, a part of the mythology of the society, the young society, the face of the future. Um, so, the, so what is happening is that as the sense is growing that the direct link of personal memories is no longer there, the more urgency there is to start recording the past and to create a commemoration of that, uh, of that past. 
So there is uh, an anecdote that uh, we heard in uh, Israel, someone, a friend told us, of a woman uh, of the Palmach generation who tells her husband that she's going to go to a reunion of her uh, uh, class and she's going to be late, so he shouldn't worry. And, um, and, you know, after half an hour, she's back and he's totally surprised and he asks her what happened and she says, well, I don't know what happened, but none of the kids were there, only the parents came. <laughs> so, <laughs> that gives you a sense of the, <laughs> the struggle to come to terms with the reality. Of course, there are other uh, issues that, uh, that are uh, facing and even there I wouldn't say everything, but in the 50s, there is an influx of new immigrants. I mentioned it also in the previous lectures. Um, and uh, the new immigrants, Holocaust survivors, uh, refugees from Europe, but also uh, from the Middle East, from Northern Africa. And the kind of assumptions of familiarity with the pioneering past that were shared by the veteran society, by the people who grew up there, could no longer be sustained because these people did not necessarily share these memories and the, and the values of that society. So there is a growing need to uh, commemorate, to create, to establish uh, strategies of commemoration and to establish narratives that introduce that past that is no longer taken for granted, either because it moves to the past, becomes an older past, or because the society has become so diverse that there is no longer a, a tacit agreement on the, that uh, past. Um, in the 60s, we also see, and definitely in the 70s after that, the weakening of the national heroic orientation, the weakening of the collectivist ethos, the rise of indi the individualistic ethos. There is a sense of crisis after the, seven, the, the 73 Yom Kippur War, and there are more political, social, economic rifts in the society. And so there is a greater necessity to, uh, to uh, not only the face the present, but also to establish the memory of the past. And because in the late 70s, 80s, there is a sense of crisis exactly at that mainstream society, the Ashkenazi, a veteran society, and a kind of looking back at the past and trying to re-evaluate re it, we see now two, uh, largely I would say, yeah, two responses. Uh, one is a response of nostalgia, and the other one is a response of looking more critically at the past. And I will try to uh, address each of these movements as we uh, progress with uh, unfolding the establishment of the memory of the pioneering past. So first of all, it's the rise of an interest in the, in the Israeli past. In the beginning, um, there isn't such an interest because so much is future-oriented. But in the late 60s, um, we have two radio programs that become really um, a focus of interest. And you have to remember that in the 60s, there is still no Israeli television. So it's really the radio is the main channel of uh, mass communication in Israel. Um, one series is My Father's House, Bet Avi, uh, where people talk about their, uh, their childhood and their uh, parents. And another series is What a Life, Chaim uh, Shekaele, when people talk about uh, and are introduced with different people, there is an element of drama and surprise. But what is interesting is that both of them look back rather than look at the present or the future, and that both series attract uh, a lot of attention. In fact, Chaim Shekaele, the second uh, series, um, What a Life, goes on, uh, moves from the radio to the television when television is introduced and goes on for more than 30 years, which gives you a sense of the attractiveness of the program. 
Um, at this period, we start seeing more in the 70s and even more so in the 80s. Since the 80s, it's a real pronounced uh, um, a, a trend, cultural trend of writing memoirs, biographies, production of documentary and dramatic films, theatrical plays, and fiction all serve as venues to address the pre-state uh, past. Now, one area where we see the growth of commemoration is, of course, in the area of museums. Um, during the 1950s, when you look at the museums, the kind of map of museums in Israel, and some of them I addressed in the second lecture vis-a-vis -vis the uh, exile, but now I will focus on the Israeli past. During the 50s, we see a more museums, and I'm talking about small museums, not just the, the national ones, that there is a greater interest in archaeology. And that very much goes with what I spoke about in the first lecture, in the importance of creating the bridges to antiquity. The idea of creating a museum on the Israeli past doesn't really come up, you know, it's still, and when ideas come up, they are not really uh, acted upon. I mean, it takes time, so for instance, um, there is an idea to establish a museum for Hashomer, the first defense organization. If you remember the photos that I showed you with them riding the horses and with the Middle Eastern look. Um, so the idea is uh, raised in 1957. The museum opens only in 1969. So it takes all these years, even though people agree on the idea, um, to actually carry it out. And in 69, it marks the 60th anniversary of the organization. So that gives it a push to actually get, get, uh, to get on the ground. Um, another museum in Ramat Aviv, in Tel Aviv, the Land of Israel Museum, Museum Eretz Israel, is founded in 1958. Um, and it again enhances the ancient modern axis of the Zionist uh, memory. Um, so it's still within the framework of the, of the bridges to antiquity. Um, other local museums that I would like to mention, the Etzel Museum, this is the underground of the, of the right, the Zionist rights, the revisionist, is established in 1983. And of course, it's connected to the rise of Likud to government that they want to establish their own uh, museums. Um, and then the most interesting from that perspective is the Palmi Palmach Museum. A uh, relatively uh, new museum was uh, established in 2000. And that is the kind of a stamp that the process of receding to the past. Here is the Palmach are the people who are the, symbol, the symbols of youthfulness, the sabras of the future, and the museum actually kind of put the stamp on it that the Palmachnik becomes a relic, becomes a, a matter of the past, and you need to memorialize the Palmach because otherwise the youth would not really know what are the Palmachniks. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, museum. It's very dynamic. There are projection of scene, uh, scenes of youth that are, it's really film. It's professional actors who play and then it's screened in a, a enclaves as you go through the a path that they direct you through. Um, what is interesting is that there are also local museums, historical museums that start to emerge and very often the trigger for the foundation of a small museum um, is an anniversary. The issue of the settlement goes through a certain anniversary. Very often it's uh, somebody amateur, you know, who kind of takes on the idea, um, maybe a group of amateurs, and they mobilize local support. They start collecting materials, objects, documents, and then they get an official recognition and the museum goes through a process of prof professionalization. Um, the early kibbutz settlement museum was founded in Ifat, the kibbutz Ifat in 1972, and it's very early. It really is before, the, before others, and it gives inspiration, the real movement of uh, kibbutzim uh, to uh, establish uh, their uh, settlement, their settlement uh, uh, museums is in the 1980s. Um, and in the 1980s, the kibbutzim go through a crisis in terms of their economic foundation, in terms of the 
structural changes and they need and also they lose their social status in the society because of the political uh, change from labor a controlled government to the Likud controlled government. And so it's pretty uh, uh, understandable why there is such an emphasis then that because there are such changes, they need to redefine the past and to establish the record of their contribution to Israeli society, which beforehand had been assumed um, as, a, as a given. Um, uh, here I uh, uh, want to, those who are interested, there is wonderful work by Tamar Catriel who studied these uh, settlement museums. Um, and what is really interesting about it is that they pretty much repeat the Zionist narrative of the settlement with the basic ideas of, uh, of uh, a struggle, of uh, wilderness, of the a very tight knit uh, a society together um, and uh, reinforce the Zionist narrative in that. The theme that is probably the most recurrent and in terms of the rhetoric of introducing this uh, um, uh, period is the theme of either pioneering, halutzim, but even more so of being the first. And it's very interesting because the uh, word first is also the founders, it's Rishonim, which means both first and founders. And in many places, it's called the Museum of the Rishonim, or the Founders Museum, but it also means the first ones. I mean, it has both meanings implied in the name. So for instance, the Historic, Petach Tikva, the Historic Museum of Petach Tikva, uh, uh, in the introduction, uh, of, the, of the preservation of Petach Tikva, which is one of the early Moshevot, uh, the settlements of the first Aliyah. Uh, they write, they present Petach Tikva as the first Hebrew Mosheva that was established prior to the first Aliyah in 1878. So it's not only first, it's the first of the first, right? And then Kibbutz Ruchama in the, in the Negev, um, present itself as the first settlement in the Negev. So it doesn't have the glory of the first uh, in general, but it is, for, is first in another context, and, it, and it's the founder's historic site, Atar HaRishonim, uh, and it's established only in 1986. So you see when it is that the society becomes, you know, that the settlements realize that they need to do it. Now the building was there, it's only in 86 that they decide that this should be a historical uh, site. There is the, but there are also new uh, things that are built. Um, there is a, a historic museum that is based on a model, and this is the Tower and Stockade historical site, which is in Hebrew identified as Chomao Migdal. These are the settlements that were built during the Arab Revolt from 36 to 39. And the, the model is based on the first settlement, Tel Amal, um, in the 30s. So now if you go to the, the uh, Sachne Park or the Gana Shlosha, the three garden, you know, you are able to see this uh, museum. Um, but even in, uh, in um, uh, Yerucham, which is an immigrant town, um, so that was built after the foundation of the state, still incorporates the same idea. So they, they have the forest, and the forest is, uh, those who can read Hebrew, is Choshat Arishonim, is the founder's uh, forest, and again, the founder's means also the first ones. Um, this museum um, uh, become a part of internal tourism that is on the rise, and I will return to it uh, in a minute. Now, of course, Israel is not built just by kibbutzim and by uh, moshevim. They are actually the minority, and we have the big cities. Jerusalem has always been a historic city and always an attraction to tourists. And Tel Aviv was actually, its aura was a little bit like the Hebrew youth. Its aura, or its, uh, its reputation was being the city that represents the future, the youthful, you know, this is the first Hebrew city, um, new, dynamic, vibrant, and it's not old. So again, there we see a gap between the city aging, 
the buildings beginning to deteriorate. Actually, some of them really look sad, and there is still not a sense that this has to be preserved because it comes under this aura of youthfulness and, uh, and uh, modernity. And in fact, the Gimnazia Herzliya, which is, was the historical building of the high school, of the school in Tel Aviv, is destroyed in 1959. And instead of that, there is a high rise, Migdal Shalom, the Shalom Tower that is built in Tel Aviv in what is now the, the financial district in Tel Aviv. And after this is done, there is an outcry in Israel about that, how could they have destroyed that building? And the starting of more awareness of the need to preserve historical sites. Um, of course, um, Tel Aviv uh, is uh, uh, eventually recognized relatively recently in, uh, by UNESCO as the site of the, as a world cultural heritage site of the Bauhaus architecture. Um, there is much more awareness of preservation and commemoration. Here is a picture of some of the dignitaries of uh, Tel Aviv in the part uh, in Evet Sedek in the earlier uh, neighborhood of Tel Aviv. And there is now a real strong movement of preservation in Tel Aviv. I mean, the Bauhaus uh, uh, after the recognition by UNESCO, but even started beforehand. Um, one other development that is important is the development of regional tourism associations that are really organized in order to promote tourism, and I think that is really a help to promote uh, these, uh, these uh, presentations. So the reenactment of the past that we see in different uh, contexts is, first of all, we see the reenactment strategy, one strategy is by way of models or mannequins, and here it's from the Defense uh, Museum, um, we see that they are creating a scene of the past and they, we can see the palmachniks, you know, the way that they are uh, um, uh, presented. And as I mentioned to you, in the Palmach, this is not in the Palmach Museum, this is in the Defense Museum, Haganah Museum in Tel Aviv. In the, so you have these mannequins there, except now they have changed the display, um, and, but they have other uh, mannequins. Um, and in the Palmach, uh, we have it by screening, by photo, uh, uh, projecting uh, film. But we have other places where, and that has become a very common strategy, um, of visitors participating in activities where they are invited to embody figures of the past. What is interesting is if you remember the first lecture, I talked about it, and also in the second, about antiquity. In the second lecture, I talked about the same strategy in terms of exile. So we see that actually as we progress, you know, these are, the strategies move on to include also the other periods. And so in this uh, museum, the, the Tower and Stockhead historical uh, site, the visitors are invited to fill up baskets with small stones to build the wall. You know, it's a tower and the wall that was uh, done. And they're invited to put on pioneers clothing. You know, you can think this is centuries old and to take a picture um, of that and uh, so on. Um, now the reenactments also have another venue and this is again something that we see as uh, developing in the cultural scene is when settlements uh, uh, celebrate their anniversaries, they try to reenact historical events. And it's a kind of a performance that is part of the collective commemoration. So for instance, in Petach Tikva, when it celebrates its 130th anniversary, they are doing reenactment of uh, Yoel Moshe Solomon, you know, one of the first founders. There's a historical journey of five riders, five people who ride horses from Yafo to Jaffa to Petach Tikva, and they are doing this uh, ride. Um, and the mayor explains that they are doing the original route in authentic clothes. So again, we have this rhetoric of authenticity that is so much important in order to convince people that indeed this is the reenactment of the, of the past. Um, there is a, a historical photo of the first 60 um, families 
in uh, Tel Aviv that were drawing lots in the sand, and that has become a, that became a, canon, a, a canonic a, a picture of that past. Tel Aviv decided that it invites all this, the residents who want to send their pictures, and they were doing a kind of a, a reenactment of that historical picture. What is interesting in both cases that it's not only reenactment of the historical event, it's also reenactment of the folklore that had been created about the historical events. So for instance, when they do these five, horse, uh, five riders on horses in Petah Tikva, they allude to a song that was, became a very famous song that refers back to the, to the historical event as you know, they're going to, to uh, reenact that. And in this particular case, the photo became already a representation in its own right, and now the other photo commemorates the commemoration of the, commem of the historical uh, event. Another marketing uh, device is uh, following the steps of, and we see it, I mean, that's in quotes, that you know, come to this place and you will follow the steps of the pioneers who established this, or the, the founders who did this, or the youth who did this and that. And one other um, a, a development out of that is not a follower of the historical events, but as I tried to show before, it's following a representation of the historical events, and that comes in literary tours that do not really follow, you don't follow in the steps of historical figures, but you uh, follow the, the novels that describe that past. So for instance, in the uh, Jezreel uh, Valley, uh, you can go, and to Nahalal, you can go following the steps of Meir Shalev uh, in his famous book, Roman Roussi, or The Blue Mountain. Or in uh, Jerusalem, you can follow uh, Shai Agnon, the noble, the Israel Lorette uh, noble, or Amos Oz, his autobiography. They started with tools with it. So it's the commemoration of the commemoration of the, of the event. And in the uh, Kinneret, you can follow the historic founders of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, the literature about the people who were in that area, they offer a special literary tour for them. Um, another theme that is coming through, um, and I have to tell you, these are all things that I just looked at different things and tried to see what are the patterns that start to emerge. It's not that you know it's presented that way, but it's only when you start really following up and you start to see what is the emphasis. And so what I'm trying to give you now actually just to frame it, these are all patterns that I can observe through the analysis of these uh, materials. So another uh, theme that I thought was really interesting, kind I didn't expect it, um, is the use of uh, time travel. Now, that there is time travel in antiquity, which I presented here. It looks so surprising, you know, it's centuries, uh, we are talking about 2,000 years, so you know, you can kind of expect that there will be the theme of traveling back in time. But when you go back to the pre-state years or even to the 50s, you kind of do not assume that you need major technology to, uh, <laughs> to get there. Uh, but it is a theme that I saw in many of these presentation and what really kind of finally, you know, is a, made it clear that this is a theme, is a series of uh, children books that was established in 1997 by a very prolific known uh, Israeli writer for Ray children, Galila Ron Federamit, and it's called Minheret Hazman, Time Tunnel. Now, it still doesn't mean what it is, except when you start to see what is presented there. And the series actually focuses on the issue on the pre-state past. Um, and it has 40 volumes in 10 years. She writes 40 volumes, and out of them, most of the volumes address things that happened in the pre-state past. So she definitely begins with it, with very few on exile that is closed, that it's somehow related to Israel. Um, and uh, only the 41st, after 10 years, is about the Hashmonaim, the Hasmoneans, 
So only then she turns to the, to the... Now that's very interesting because on the one hand, it's obvious why she does it. She feels that, you know, and it's not only her educators feel that the young people, students, don't really know the history of the pre-state, so you have to create the literature that would pull them and through that they will know. So the story is a very basic story. It's a couple of kids, 10 years old. They go into a cave near their the neighborhood in Jerusalem. Once they get into the cave, the cave, there is a wind that carries them, and they land somewhere, and it takes them some time to figure out what historical event they landed into, and then they start to, to meet the people, they interact with them, they follow up what's going on, and through the description, of course, the reader learns about that particular past. And then at the end, they are brought back to the cave, and they return home uh, safely. So the, what is interesting is that the idea of the, of the time tunnel series is obviously that she wants them to learn about the, the past, and it echoes the children's own sense that this is you know, a remote past. But in fact, when you look at it or when you think about it, it becomes another measure of distancing that past back into the past. Because for the, in other words, it reinforces children's idea that this is a remote past because if you need to go through a cave and that would carry you into the past and there is really no major difference between being carried past to antiquity or being carried into the past to the, the pre-state past, it makes the pre-state past look very old, very far away. Um, and that's also about the museum, the same thing you can say about the museum. It has this double edge idea that on the one hand you commemor commemorate the past, on the other hand by the very fact that you put this past into a museum, you also make it look older and you kind of freeze it in that. Um, and we move on from that to the idea of the nostalgic look at the past. Um, so that begins, the nostalgic view begins already in the 50s itself, you know, after the war, after the when, you know, after the first waves of immigration. Um, you hear it from the, actually, the, the Palmach generation itself. The sense of, we miss that heroic past that we had, that we shared. Um, and uh, I want to quote to you from uh, the words of Ehud ben Ezer, uh, who is from Petah Tikva, um, an, an Israeli writer, and he writes, as the years are passing, one would feel the need to, of both writers and readers to hold on to the Eretz Israeli landscape. The land of legend, the mythology of the birth of a nation, a city gro growing out of the sand, a new beginning. So he's repeating all these catchphrases of the new beginning, of the legend, the myth, and so on. But in fact, this is already at the time that he feels that they need to clutch on to them because they are very disappearing. Um, I want to give you another example, and that's from a more, uh, actually just an ad that I happened to see uh, not so far, but you will see that it's the same um, attitude. An ad about a, a book that was published about Tel Aviv, and the book is called, entitled Remnants. And actually, the word is also in English. I mean, it appears in Hebrew and uh, English uh, and Arabic. And, it, um, and when you think about the word remnant, remnant is really part of the discourse of nostalgia. I mean, it really means there was a past. It has gone by. Very little of it has remained. And we have to clutch on to it. What really struck me is that the name of the author, which is Honi, uh, Honi the Circle Maker. Now, those who know the Talmud, you know that the Choni, the circle maker, was a rabbi, and there is the story in the Talmud that he fell asleep and he woke up, you know, the, in the, another generation somewhere in the future, not in his time. And when you think about it, obviously the author, I don't know who the author is, but, you know, but took his the pseudonym, then it em emphasizes, reinforces the idea of a remnant. You know, like Choni, he himself is now in an age that he doesn't really belong, and that's why he needs to look back and to fight the remnant of the past. 
So we see a lot of uh, work through uh, reproduction of the Hebrew culture in text, in sounds, in images, uh, DVD, books, albums, museum uh, exhibits, educational programs, um, and um, and all the all kinds of aspects of Israeli cultural life that was taken for granted. Why would you need to talk about food or about children's game or greeting cards? These are all things that have become topics of exhibits in Israeli uh, museums. But now they are not taken for granted anymore. So yes, there are appropriate topics for museum and for, uh, for exhibits. Similarly, the holidays. Um, holidays that were commemorated in Israel um, during the pre-state period that are really important uh, holidays. Um, we uh, don't see them anymore celebrated in the same way. So the places that still retain them, like Kibbutzim and Moshevim, invite people from the outside to come to these ceremonies, to be part of these uh, ceremonies. Um, and uh, in a, a few years ago, um, my husband and I went to see the Milk and Honey Festival that is in the Jezreel the Valley, um, the celebration of Shavuot, and it was very interesting because it was a combination of the old ritual of women wearing white gowns with flowers on the head and so on, but also they had a whole a display of harvest machinery. You never want to see so many machines as they were there. With the culmination was a tractor tango that you know that, <laughs> that we saw there. But it was a spectacle, you know. I mean, the place was. I mean, people came from Tel Aviv, from other areas, you know, to uh, watch this uh, display. Music and dance becomes our areas where there is a tremendous uh, attachment and where the nostalgia is much more uh, visible uh, there. And so you have the singing groups, Chavurot Zemer, you have Shira Betzibur, the sing along, that are very much part of Israeli gay culture. And you have a genre that is identified as Shirei Eretz Israel, the songs of Eretz Israel. And of course, when you hear Eretz Israel, it means the land of Israel. It means that this is a nostalgic reference to the land of Israel prior to the state of Israel. And so that's already a cue word um, in Hebrew that you move to the mode of nostalgia to the past, to that uh, past. Um, and um, what you have um, is people getting together. Um, they may pay for it and you know go it's an, and through entertainment uh, view, uh, venues or it can be just spontaneous in private homes, and sing together songs that are songs that kind of express the uh, simplicity, the closeness to nature, the uh, patriotic feelings, um, uh, songs of the wars, um, and uh, so on. And I want to mention a book by uh, uh, Moti Regev and Eddie Sarusi, um, that actually reviews different genres in Israeli popular music. And those of you who are interested, that would be an interesting uh, uh, book to look at. So you, hear, you see here the folk dances. Um, OK, here it is. Um, the place where you can see a really interesting ritual of commemoration. Those of you who may have been in the old Kinneret Cemetery, um, there are two graves there. The older one is of the poet Rachel. I mentioned her very poetry um, uh, on, on Rachel, on Rachel in the first lecture. And Naomi Shemer is a famous uh, lyricist, uh, singer, um, and um, a songwriter. And what happens there is that people come to visit the, the cemetery and they start singing old songs and it becomes a tribute to these uh, women. And so the next one you can see um, uh, the women. You see here, this is a group uh, that came and they are standing there around the grave and are singing these, uh, these uh, songs. 
Um, just to tell you that it's not my invention, that there is a nostalgic uh, element in all that, is that the website that carries, or one of the websites where you can get words of Hebrew songs is actually called Nostalgia. I mean, that's the name of the, of the website. Uh, Nahum Hyman, who put together the, and who really worked uh, to, um, to uh, rescue and preserve Hebrew folk songs, in this last year, Yom Ha'atzma'ut uh, received the Israel Prize in recognition of his achievements and contribution to folk songs. But I found other uh, internet websites. Uh, one of them is called Song Network, Zemereshet. And again, they define their mission to rescue the Hebrew song. So it's very interesting to see this rhetoric of, uh, now of, uh, of rescuing and of uh, preservation. Um, there is uh, another group that uh, I found an article about them, the Wandering Song Club. It's a group of young people who got together in order to revive the Palmach spirit. They kind of uh, admire its Chak Sadeh, the commander of the Palmach, and they meet together at night in nature and they sing songs. And of course, the songs of Eretz Israel. So all these are expressions of uh, this. And of course, there are other. There is a, a singer. Uh, Moshe Lahav, they, they calls his performances the big tish, and the tish is the Hasidic tish. And he became a kind of a, you know, a popular, a, the most popular, he has his groupies who follow him from one place to another, performing and whatever. So you see also the religious dimension, or the, the, and the people uh, of the club, the wandering club, actually talk about it as a relig in religious terms. I actually have quotes from them referring to it as a tradition, like lighting candles in Shabbat. Um, another word that shows the tremendous uh, nostalgia to the past is a Hebrew a phrase. Um, and I'll say it in Hebrew so we can listen to it. It's very simple and it rhymes. And it says, ta'am shel pa'am. <laughs> and it means a taste of the good old days. And I googled it and there are more than 71,000 references to that. Within it, you can see things like a historical museum, restaurants, food product, book title, company that organizes birthdays, furniture store. I mean, so there are a lot of stuff, but it's a very common uh, phrase. And there is also a store that I saw, Dvarim Shel Pam, of the same, uh, of the same venue. Um, what we see is the rise beyond this nostalgia to the past is then the opposite, um, uh, the opposite trend, the counter nostalgic or the critical trend. Now that trend actually looks at the past and rather than glorifying it or trying to look at it from a nostalgic perspective, actually looks at the commemoration of the past of the Israeli, the Zionist narrative about the pre-state past and looking at the excessive ideological and selective uh, representation of that past and actually claims that it distorts the historical reality. Now the mythicization of the Yishuv past actually begins at the time of the Yishuv. And part of it is really commissioned by Zionist organizations in order to do fundraising abroad. Um, and, you know, kind of showing glorious pictures of the settlers, the pioneers, the, the making the desert bloom, the gathering of the, of the ingathering of exiles, and so on. By the mid 60s, there are already expressions of the culture and criticizing the excessive glorification that has really got out to the, uh, the uh, depth of the, Hebrew, of the Hebrew culture and the memory of the past, especially when it refers to, uh, to uh, uh, leaders. So in 1973, um, there is a popular book, Eretz Tzion Yerushalayim, um, that uh, two uh, is popular Israeli writers, Shlomo Shva and Dan Ben Amotz, who is a kind of a palmachnik actor, a artist, um, they published a book, and that's what they write in the introduction. The vision of Zionism and pioneering that our teachers brought up in history classes was populated by cardboard heroes 
And the cardboard heroes is a phrase that is repeated, uh, who recited the reflections with great pathos. And the pathos is another thing that the young Israelis go against. Suddenly, they found boxes of old newspapers, and they actually read the history as it comes from these old newspapers. And it's so much more interesting, this mythical representation, than that they say, suddenly the cardboard figures became alive, and in front of our eyes, we saw the period emerging with bold colors in details unknown to us until that point. So here are the people who are themselves part of the past, and when they see the past of the parents or the generation of the parents, they realize that they already, what they got to know from that past, the past of the pioneers, the Halutzim, is actually a mythical presentation. There is a novel that was written in 1965 by Aharon Meged, another writer of the Palmach generation. And the author, uh, the, the protagonist is a writer who's commissioned to go and to write a, a biography of a, um, a pioneer, a kind of a legendary pioneer. And the whole story is about how he goes and when he does historical research about it, and he realizes that there is such a gap between the legendary image and the pioneer and the, the, the real historical person that he find he's paralyzed, he can't really write, produce, uh, produce that. In the, my book, Recovered Roots, Collective Memory and the Making of Israeli Tradition, I actually have a long discussion of the issue of what is called legendary and what is called historical, not by what it really is, but what people believe it is. So when they believe that this is true, they say it's historical. When they don't believe, they say it's legendary, even though it could actually have historical truth, but it sounds so much like all these mythical representation that it brings to this belief. And indeed, in the 1980s, there is a whole trend of niputz mitosim, the shattering of myths, um, that is by Israelis who look at the myth, the Israeli national myth critically and try to see what has happened both in history and at the level of memory, but they are most concerned at the level of memory because this is what comes into play in terms of the present politics. Um, and my book, my earlier book, is also dealing with that uh, issue. Of course, you probably know that, and I will just mention, I'm not going to go into this, the part that is most challenged is the war, the 1947-49 war, the war that is commemorated as the War of Independence, where in the late 80, 1980s, scholars are looking back at that past, the, some archives are very uh, opened, and there is a look back at the Zionist narrative about the war, about the expulsion of Arabs during the war, the active prevention of the uh, former residents to come back to their homes, and also an interest in the construction of uh, the Palestinian national identity, and of course, Joel Migdal's uh, work with uh, Baruch uh, Kimmerling is one of the important books in this area. Now, some of these people are called new historians, revisionist historians, post-Zionists. It becomes a big issue in uh, Israel. But what is important is the very act of trying to look back at that past and to come up with a more nuanced and uh, uh, history that also takes into account the perspective of the other. Now, it's very hard to summarize where we stand with that, and I actually can see, and I will share with you my observations to date, uh, but it really is you know, very much a part of the process. On the one hand, there is much more literature about it, literature that appears in Hebrew, even if it was written in English, um, has been translated into Hebrew, and Israelis read this literature, the intellectuals. A research that was conducted uh, by uh, two scholars um, actually shows that at the popular level, when you ask Israelis what they know about or to tell the story about the past, actually, what you hear is mostly is the re, uh, repetition or the re-embracement of the Zionist uh, narrative with you know, presenting it more in terms of the, from the Jewish perspective. Um, 
although it's probably a little bit more balanced than uh, it was. But in that sense, you know, with all this literature and all this, you know, outcry about the new historians, the revisionist historians, the impact on the actual knowledge of the past in terms of Israelis, I don't think has made a tremendous uh, dent or, or in depth. But it's not totally so. Um, there are also signs that, yes, maybe it's really the narrative is, has not changed, but that popular Israeli memory um, has incorporated more awareness that there is another uh, narrative. And that awareness had not been there before. So there is a change. And I'll give you one simple indication and then some others. The most straightforward, simple indication that I can uh, give for that is that the concept Nakba, which is catastrophe in Arabic, that refers it's how the Palestinians see the, what happened in 1948 from their perspective was a concept we didn't know about it in the 1950s, in the 1960s. You know, today it's a concept that is used in Israeli media, is Israeli newspapers. It actually has been incorporated into Hebrew. So one cannot say that there has not been a change. If Nakba is there, it means that some awareness of the alternative uh, is there. There is also a lot of activity by artists who incorporate the Zionist, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Palestinian uh, memory exhibits, photos, uh, uh, paintings, and so on. Uh, there is an organization, um, Zohrot, which is interesting because it means we remember, it's in the present, and it's in the female form. You know, in Hebrew you have a distinguish between male and female uh, forms. And this organization goes around and um, actually reenacts the, the Palestinian memory by putting signs of name place, uh, place names or street names in Arabic. Um, and actually on the website you see also male I'll show you the pictures in a minute. So you will see, uh, I mean, I guess it started why uh, women and it uh, kept, uh, kept uh, its name. Other signs, there are Palestinian writing uh, that has been translated into Hebrew. Now, Mahmoud Darvish, who is the Palestinian national poet, has been translated into Hebrew. Actually, Yossi Sarid from Meretz, so it's a lefty uh, minister of education, in 2000 wants to, be, not wants, includes it in the, in the curriculum, um, and it creates a scandal, although the poems that he includes are really not political, but just the idea that he included the, the poems of a Palestinian activist. Um, a play, a, a, another Palestinian who is both a writer and an activist is dead, Kanafi. Um, his work was translated about 30 years ago, but when they tried to put a play, a Teatron Kamri, so it's really a, one of the mainstream theaters in Israel, puts a, a, a play, a, up a play, only, um, only uh, recently, there, actually there was a demonstration by people from the, on the right who come and do a, a demonstration because it is someone who is identified as a, a, a Palestinian politician. So what I want to say is that there are, there are representations of the, a, of the a Zionist narrative that really play them probably the a greatest a role in the commemoration of the past, but there are also the diversity of representing the a Palestinian past that I think it really is, depends on who is aware of that and who is not, and there it's where the politics of identity and the politics of the, a, the present come into play. Um, what I try to do in this series, Encounters with the Past, um, I called it symbolic bridges to a, bygone, uh, to a bygone past because what I tried to show is that at a certain point the society uh, uh, feels that it does need to deliberately construct uh, venues of commemoration of the past that is no longer accessible. And as we moved on, I wanted to show how in the beginning it's mostly the antiquity 
that is the target of these commemorative efforts, and the opposite is the withdrawal, the dissociation from exile, and how later on this becomes transformed where antiquity is taken for granted and is therefore less interesting. It's not that people deny it so much as that it's less interesting, although there are also questions about, uh, about the roots in antiquity. It's a minor uh, voice, relatively speaking. Um, and a lot of um, uh, effort and thought and uh, tensions are actually around the bridges to exile. This is where probably the most fertile uh, domain in Israeli culture is figuring out the continuity from exile, the relationship with the diaspora, relation, the relation to religion, to uh, one's identity, ethnic traditions, and so on. Um, and of course, the pre-state past is still open to, you know, I've actually addressed a topic that is very much still in process and we don't really know how it will be formed. Let me see what else we can sh I can show you here. Um, these are the kind of pictures, nostalgic pictures of the past when we were children. Again, a very nostalgic past, the kind of prototypical uh, village at the back. Um, the other side, the militaristic, you know, the children of the, of the 1948. This is a program for uh, children today. Uh, the kind of nostalgic books that we have now, this is about food, very recent. Um, and again, you know, we, that's already including the 50s. Um, the Haggadahs, the Passover Haggadahs in the Kibbutzim. A new collection, very interesting about this uh, experiment. A store in Tel Aviv, Dvarim Shel Pa'am, things of the old good, uh, the old good uh, days or old good times. Um, and then to show you that yes, within <coughs> Tel Aviv, we still have you know, the very modern landscape, but there is the Hassan Bek uh, Mosque. You see the Hassan Bek Mosque that has been preserved. Other things have not been preserved. There is a museum for Bedouin heritage in the Galilee. Um, and these are pictures from the Zohrot website. Okay.